Well, I, I'd like to thank you for inviting me, and I'd like to you know, say that, uh, like every other citizen of my of our country, we are extremely proud of our military, and especially proud of the fact that the military has kept the traditions of professionalism and democracy continuously for the from 1947 onwards, without even a flicker. And I think in this it is really unique among almost all the militaries in Asia. And therefore, it's a great honor to be here. It's a great privilege to be here. Now, the second point, of course, I'd like to make is that I come here from a private university. And I come here as an individual who has never, ever been in government in any form whatsoever. Because in a democracy, we have multiple power centers, multiple sources of influence, in a sense, multiple lobbies. And these lobbies may compete with each other or work with each other, and government is just one of these lobbies or these power centers. Other power centers are there, other groups are there, civil society is there, uh, industry and commerce are there, the farm sector is there, so many other groups are there. And all these groups coalesce in the making of policies, or at least they should coalesce in the making of policies. I've come to talk to you today on the concept of idealism and realism in Indian foreign policy. Now, I want to just begin with a few, you know, of just basically setting the stage or setting the background for that. Because policies don't evolve in a vacuum. Policies don't, in a sense, they're not free-floating entities. They are based on ground realities and they are based in specific context in a specific set of circumstances. So when we look at policies that are being followed in India even to this day, we obviously have to go back in time. And the question is, how far back in time do we have to go back? Do we go back to 1947, when India became an independent country? And if so, was that such a total firebreak from the past? Or do we have to go back even further, let's say to 1945? Well, what was the world like? at the end of the Second World War? Or do we have to go back even further? I would like to start in 1939, the beginning of the war, and a very momentous decision of the Indian political leadership at that time, which essentially was a decision to become neutral in the ongoing struggle between the Axis and the Allies. A lot of the subsequent policy of Great Britain towards India which finally culminated in what we saw in 1947, owe their origins to the 1939 decision of neutrality, followed in 1942 by the very famous Quick India Resolution. Now, Britain was fighting a war, was fighting a war against Japan, the Japanese were in the sense of the borders of India, and at that point in time, a very strong call was given to quit India. Obviously, this has had an impact on the British policy on the British mindset, and that impact has continued to the present. So why I wanted to tell you is that actions that have been taken today can have an impact 30, 40 years later. Actions that were taken 80 years ago, and 70 years ago, can still exercise an impact now. And in my view, 1939 decision to be neutral in the world war was a very important uh, decision, because from that time, imperceptibly at first, and then very obviously the British authorities, both in London and in Delhi, started turning towards the Muslim League, which was strongly supporting the Second World War on the Allied side. So from 1939 onwards, the British authorities started turning very strongly towards the Muslim League, and the consequence of that was not only seen in 1947 with the partition of India, but it has also been seen in very many subsequent issues thereafter, including the treatment of Kashmir and including various other issues. So that was a very consequential, in a sense, foreign policy decision of the leadership of the country, of the leadership of the Indian people at that point in time. So which is why, for me, the starting point is 1939. <coughs> but let's go, let's telescope into the war and 1945. What was the world like in 1945? In 1945, you had a situation in which the European countries were exhausted by the war. Britain was almost bankrupt financially. 
Britain had been exhausted by the war. Germany was destroyed by the war. In that situation, holding on to the Indian Empire became less and less viable as an option. <clears throat> and because this is an academic lecture, because I'm coming as an academic, I'm not coming on behalf of any of the government or any department of the government, I can exercise my academic freedom to tell you, in my view, in our history books, we do not give credit for a very important reason why the British were forced to leave India in 1947. In our history books, it's all because of a non-violent and peaceful freedom struggle. We had a civilized discussion with them. They had a civilized discussion with us. And two civilized people came to a conclusion that we should leave in 1947. It is not as simple as that. For one thing, along with the non-violent uh, thing, there was a strong violent movement as well, which continued for many decades. But more importantly, after their experience in war in 1945, Indian officers and men of the armed forces began to realize that as a colonized people, they would not have the rights, the professional freedoms, and the professional future that they deserve. And as a consequence, the loyalty, if I may say so, to the Raj diminished very significantly after 1945. Previous to that, I would say the loyalty factor to the Raj was very significant. But after 1945, the loyalty factor became very, very low. And in fact, apart from the INA, there were also other factors which you know about. I mean, this is all there, very common in the history books. I'm not going to repeat history like the naval nuclear things to you. But the reality is the British understood that they could no longer depend on the Indian officers and men of the Army, Navy, and Air Force to hold India by force. And that, in the opinion of several historians, Unfortunately, nobody in India, but this factor has not really been, been accepted in India. But abroad, many historians are of the view that it is this reality that you can no longer use the Indian component of the armed forces to keep the, your control. That was a very important decision behind the British decision to quit India and to quit India by 15th August 1947. So I'd like to say that when we talk about freedom fighters, the men and women in uniform were also freedom fighters by their approach, by their attitude, by their anti-colonial attitude, by their standing up for human rights and individual rights. They also played a very significant role in the freedom struggle and it's a role I think that all of you can be very proud of. Now, that, so that is the first point is that foreign policy extends into the past even as it pertains to the future. The second point is decisions that, that corollaries, decisions made in the past affect the present, could affect the future. I want to start, a, a second set of assumptions I want to make. And that is that what exactly constitutes realism and idealism in foreign policy? What is the, what is the question, what is realism and what is idealism in foreign policy? Now, if you talk about idealism, it has to be related to a concrete set of objectives and, in a sense, realities. If you don't talk of idealism in relation to something concrete, you're basically talking about a mirage. And a mirage is something impossible to attain. So if you base a policy on a mirage, you're going to be very disappointed. It's going to be a bad policy. So the so-called divergence between realism and idealism is actually not really a very sound one. It's like talking about internal and external security. In today's age, when external actors are coming inside your country, when people inside your country are going out to create problems for it, this distinction between internal and external security becomes very, very difficult and tenuous to maintain in terms of a firewall. In the same way, to talk about idealism and realism as two distinct sides of the, or, or two different uh, you know, two different coins altogether is in a sense very misleading because they are not antipodes, they are twins. They are in fact two sides of the same coin for the simple reason that without a realistic focus, without a realistic route, you cannot fulfill idealism in foreign policy and if idealism means a set of objectives that you have to fulfill, any policy is geared towards fulfilling a set of objectives. The sounder that policy is, 
the more it relates to the ground reality of the situation. So, I would like to request you to give up this concept that there is a disconnect between idealism and realism. And if you're realistic, you're not idealistic. And if you're idealistic, you cannot be realistic. The reality is, you, you can be most idealistic when you are most realistic, in the sense that it's a very strong dose of realism can enable you to achieve your ideals in a very much more uh, proper way. I'll give you, I mean, I mean, what exactly are the ideals which are in our country? Now, of course, I'm going to make certain uh, comments, etc., which are not very pleasant to listen to. But I want to tell you very clearly something that I want to give as a preface. The reality is India is well on its way to a global power status. In the next 20 to 25 years, we are going to be the third biggest economy in the world. No matter what the mistakes we make in policy, the chances are very low that we are going to be cheated with that particular destiny. So eventually, our country is going to be one of the top three powers in the world, if not in 15 years, definitely 25 years. But for that to be reached, we have to have a clear appreciation of not only what went right, but more importantly, what went wrong. You, you don't go to a doctor to show him how healthy you are. You go to a doctor when you're not well. And unfortunately or fortunately, many times, we have to analyze ourselves, we analyze the healthy parts, and we neglect the sick parts. <coughs> As a result, working out cures becomes difficult. An idealistic policy will be a policy that tries to avoid hunger, illiteracy, disease, and poverty. It will promote wealth, it will promote health, it will promote knowledge. That is, in my view, the highest form of idealism. An idealism that can ensure that the 1.3 billion people in India get a square meal to eat, have a good place to stay, and have their, their sons and daughters can take advantage of the knowledge economy and master the knowledge economy to the best solution possible. That is the highest form of idealism, at least in my definition. It is a very practical idealism, and it is and it is also an idealism which is based in, in my country. Now, why is it country specific? It is country specific because idealism cannot be of a form which is way beyond your capacity to implement or affect. Supposing, for example, you are talking in terms of, let us say, an earthquake or a tsunami. Now, I mean, you can't blame yourself for that. It's an act of nature. Now, when you are talking about certain ideals, you're talking essentially of certain objectives. And when you talk of certain objectives, you have to understand what your own strengths and weaknesses are, what your own capacities are, and you cannot have an objective that is far superior to those uh, strengths and to those strengths of yours. If it is superior, you have to build yourself up steadily by a clear, crafted strategy so that your strength reaches a level in which you can be equal to the task and to the challenge that you have met. If, let us say, for example, you talk about promoting world peace, it's a wonderful idea. I mean, so, I mean, I'm a UNESCO peace chair. I certainly am not going to talk against world peace. I mean, I'm supposed to be talking world peace 24 hours, 24 7 as a UNESCO chair. But the reality is that no single country in the world, including the United States, is strong enough to ensure world peace across the world. So if you say that our foreign policy is to ensure global peace. Quite frankly, you are making a policy which is way beyond your capacity to fulfill and you're only going to meet heavy disappointment when that policy is finally